We have got a lot of fun stuff to cover here as we get into the Gospel of Matthew. And I'm really excited about today because today there's an element of which uh, we're continuing on with what uh, we started at with a couple weeks ago, uh, which was uh, the disciples arguing with themselves and then Jesus calling them on it about who's the greatest in the kingdom. And they've got this question, this really practical question uh, the closer they get to the end where Jesus is talking more and more about how he's going to be arrested and he's going to be killed. But they're thinking he's going to become king too. And like, they're starting to feel like, what's the hierarchy? Like, who's taking over once you're gone? And so like, who's going to be the VP? Who's going to be secretary of the state and the treasurer? Like, rank us, Jesus. Like, rank us in importance. Who is the most important? Who's the most qualified to lead this thing maybe when you're gone or when you're absent or you're on vacation? Right? I mean, they want to know like hierarchy. And they're having an argument about who is actually the greater? Who's actually the better? Like, full-blown, Peter's telling James he's not as good as he is, right? Thaddeus is like, I'm better than all of you all. Everybody's going to remember me, right? I mean, they're having this whole conversation. And then finally, Jesus says, like, what are you guys talking about? Why? What are you arguing about? And he pulls that a little child up next to him and says, whoever is humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom. Or whoever is the servant of everyone, the one who wants to serve everybody, that's actually who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And he starts this whole kind of discussion based off of this idea and this premise that this is who we are, this upside down picture, as opposed to how the rest of our world works. In fact, Jesus himself models what he's talking about later when he says, that he, or not says, but actually washes his disciples' feet, right? And he washes all of their feet, but he at the same time tells them, look, I'm in charge, I'm the master, I'm your Lord, I'm your teacher, that's all true. But as I'm the one who is taking the role of the servant and washing your feet, you should do the same for each other. And so he's just setting this tone of what leadership in the church is supposed to look like. And it's a pretty significant and massive tone shift because one of the reasons why there's so many people who have walked away from church, who have got church hurt of some kind or another, have walked away because there's some kind of abuse of power. There's some kind of hurt or lack of care that has gone on in people's lives because the church wasn't really thinking about how do we get down to the level of the people that we're working with, that we're talking to, that are being hurt or frustrated in all of this, but instead are just kind of playing power trip kind of games. And I mean, I know there's people in this room who have gone through all kinds of hurtful and painful things. In fact, this church originally back in the day was birthed out of a church where that was what was going on. And people finally left, not sure what they were going to do or where they were going to go, but ultimately came together to form Bayside. And so it's a very significant component and piece of life for us to talk about and to look through and to see what Jesus has to say about it. And so we're going to pick up with where we, kind of where we ended with last week, and we'll read some of this, will be really familiar, and then we'll get into some new, new stuff as well. So starting with verse 10 of Matthew 18, it says, Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven... Their angels are always in the presence of my Father. And then just notice there's no verse 11. I didn't leave that out. Like, if you read your Bible, unless you're reading the King James, you're going to be like, whoa, what the heck happened to verse 11? But there's this little asterisk or there's this little note that lets you know that verse 11 is a verse that's not found in the the oldest manuscripts. And I'm just going to take a moment to explain this because sometimes it's confusing. There are a whole bunch of manuscripts, like 25,000 New Testament manuscripts or partial manuscripts, meaning books of of the Bible, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all the way to Revelation. There's there's thousands, literally, and they've been found in different cities, different locations, different libraries, and they're from different eras, from different ages. Some go back to the year around 1,000, but some go back to the end of the first century. And those little notes show up because they say that when this was, they go back to the oldest manuscripts, sometimes that, the verse 11 just isn't there. And so they mark it as a note that says, it's not that it's heretical or crazy. What what verse 11 says is where Jesus says, I have come to seek and to save those who are lost. Which is right out of Luke 19 when he's talking to Zacchaeus where it belongs. And it just seems like somebody added this in as they were making copy in the Bible, and maybe it was their own personal Bible, and they were making their own notes and just pointing out some little hyperlinks to things that Jesus said. But just so you know, that's part of reading the, the Bible. The New Testament is looking and seeing. There are these little notes that show up, and if it says it's not found in the earliest documents or manuscripts, anyway, that's why. So 
He said, makes this point about these little ones, how their angels are always communicating with God. So his, his emphasis is, be careful how you treat people that you see as lesser or littler than yourself. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? Just like Malin referenced in our Easter egg hunt. <laughs> And hang on. It's going to be good. Wait for it. Oh, too far that time. Okay. Um, no. Okay. And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that didn't wander away. In the same way, it is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. So look at this kind of flow that, that is being laid out for us by Jesus as he's talking here about how do we work and how do we, how do we interact with each other. As followers of Jesus specifically, he's referring to. How, how do we act? How do we act like our Heavenly Father who, using that parable, that kind of what sounds so cute, I think, to us about a shepherd who's lost a sheep and he's got to go find a cute little fuzzy white sheep and throw it over his shoulders. But honestly, if you're the shepherd, is that a cute story? No, you're like, this is your day job. You're just like, another freaking lost sheep? Like, are you kidding me? I mean, I mean that's annoying. But he's just like, no, it's work. It's effort. You don't know where they're lost. You just have to start searching the hills. Rich Farrow told me when he can't find his cows nowadays, he actually uses a drone to go hunt them down. Like, how great is that? I mean, I love that. I mean, that's the way to do it, modern technology. Otherwise, you got to go walk out there, hop on your horse or your ATV or something. But these guys had to walk the hills so they could find that sheep. Like, that's like, that's serious effort. So he's saying, this is going to be a lot of work. If, if you lose them. But he says, but it's not my father's will that anyone should be lost. So there's a man, this is one of those significant components, but what does loss look like or what does loss mean when we start to get into more of an applicational understanding of life? And Jesus walks it into this, if another believer sins against you. Now, when we use sins, first off, nobody uses the word sin unless you're in church, right? I mean, when was the last time, if you're a parent in here, when was the last time you looked at one of your kids and said, you have sinned against me? And I'm going to go with probably not ever have you said that. You, you picked on something specific. We don't really talk like this in our normal everyday language. In, in the business world, like your boss has never sat you down and been like, you have sinned against me. Unless, of course, you work at the church, and then maybe. But we don't talk like that. But he's saying like in the normal elements of life and relationships, when somebody has done something against you that is harmful, that is hurtful, uh, that breaks trust, it could be lying, it could be deceit, it could be taking something, it could be saying something untrue about you or somebody else, right? It could be any number of betrayals, big or small, in life, that when those things happen, here is what you're supposed to do because the goal or the point, as he puts it at the bottom, is to win that person back because if you don't do this, what has happened to the relationship? I love it when you guys don't know if I'm waiting for you to answer or not. Good. I usually I just talk so fast. You're like, I don't know. He's probably just going to keep going. But you all know. It's just a moment to think, right? I mean, there's, there's this real sense when we don't go after, we don't have the conversation, we don't do this, one of two things happens. Either we try to bury it, right? We sweep it under the rug and we're like, oh, I'll just get over it. But then what if it keeps going on or it keeps happening, right? Then it just kind of keeps building up inside of us and that resentment starts to grow inside of us. And then we grumble and we complain. And then we don't, every time we see them, it reminds us of that thing that they did that we've never addressed and they've never come clean on, right? Or we can look at this and just go like, well, you know what? I'm just done with that person. I'm not going to bring it up, but I'm not going to talk with them at all. I'm just going to be done with the relationship or the relationship is just going to go cold, right? I'll talk to them if I have to, if it's like a work relationship or if it's a family relationship, maybe even. But I'm not going to bring this up or address it. If we don't go down the path of actually doing what he's saying, we leave ourselves in this really negative place of our relationships falling apart. And we just got to see that how, how significant this is that we get to that last part of winning that person back. That's the point and the goal of this passage. 
And I bring that up because if you're familiar with church and you're familiar with this passage, sometimes this gets referred to as the church discipline passage. But that isn't the point that Jesus is trying to get to. His point is that this is the church reconciliation passage. The goal is to get to a place of reconciliation, not to the point of discipline. It's like when you discipline your children. You don't discipline them for the sake of disciplining them. You're disciplining them so they will grow up to become something better, someone that you love and like and want to be around, not go like, they drive me nuts, when are they leaving? Right? It's, it's keeping a closeness and health to relationships. So he goes on and says, if you are unsuccessful, right, because there's no guarantee this will work, that they'll respond well, but you go down the path. If you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. And we do chuckle at that last part. So here's something that's really important about that last little bit um, that I want to hit. And it's just this question. How did Jesus treat pagans and corrupt tax collectors? Ate dinner with them. Look at that. Mike knew that was not a rhetorical question. He's like, I'm jumping in on that one. He would eat with them. He viewed them as the people who were lost, right? How do you go and find and save the ones who are lost? You have to go to them. But you also have to understand and treat them that they're the lost ones. They're not inside the community. They're not inside of the family. They're not treating them the same as the insiders necessarily on a level of trust. But at the same time, we're not saying, I'm never going to talk to that guy again. How do I demonstrate or show the love, compassion, and forgiveness of God to those that go outside of it? And Jesus is the, the best example. He comes to a whole world of people who are all lost and outside of that. And he dives into it to try to bring people into his kingdom. And so we've got that really kind of fascinating bit and picture. And so just as we have a discussion that's going to get really practical here, we're just going to dive into like, how do we do what he's telling us to do? With a little bit of theology mixed into it as well. But you just got to be reminded, okay, if I let this sit, it likes to stop working. Okay, there we go. Reconciliation is the goal. Friendship is the goal. And you could say love is the goal, but sometimes love is a little too vague. And I think friendship at least gives you kind of a picture. Friendships are the people you want to be around in life. Like sometimes you feel like families who you're stuck with, people you work with you're stuck with, but friends are the ones you're like, what are you doing on Friday night? What are you doing on Saturday? Like, let's get together. Let's hang out. What are you, better yet, what are you doing on Sunday morning? Let's go to Bayside together. <laughs> Good. Yes. But here's the thing, like this is the goal, so the way that we get to that goal is through confrontation. Now, confrontation is not a word that I like. I hate the idea of confrontation, and I hope that if you dislike confrontation, that as we go through this, you're going to find that confrontation is not sort of the bad word that you might think it is right now. And on the other hand, if you really like confrontation, hopefully you're going to learn there's some nuances to confrontation that might make you better at it. Because there's definitely some good ways and right ways to go about this and some not so great ways to go about this. But confrontation is the way that we go. If you're a fan of the Mandalorian, just think that this is the way. Good. Thank you. My Star Wars people are here today. Excellent. Um, that's a big deal. But you may be asking this question before we even get started on this practicality of why would I want to be a part of a community that practices this? If you're not necessarily a follower of Jesus, or you're coming out of a church background that was full of hurt or pain, or you've never been a part of a church at all, if you're just a good old American, we live are independent people. I mean, we've always had this attitude, this mindset. It's, it's a cultural value is independence. Why would I want to be a part of a community that has the right to come to me and approach me and say, hey, you're doing something that you, that you shouldn't be doing? Or you're not doing something that you should be doing. And we have a serious problem with anyone approaching us with shoulds. Let alone saying, if, if you don't do these shoulds, we're going to have to talk to some other people about these shoulds and bring you in front of this group of shoulds. And this is like, a, these shoulds are big deals. And I don't know what you think it might be a big deal, but just remember where this started again with Jesus talking to his disciples about their attitude towards people who are less than they are. Their attitude towards greatness. 
I mean, these are the kind of things that are just part of everyday life and relationships, not just adultery or you got to stop robbing banks. Those are my favorite go-tos, right? Whatever you view is bad. Like, it's not just this huge thing. It's talking about the things that break down relationships. These are the things that, that create distrust and mistrust between us. How do we begin to react to those things? But why would we even want to do this? And, and here's what's so interesting is, in our culture that has already independent has now got so much of this secular attitude to it, which is, I may be a spiritual person. I don't need a religion or a church or a doctrine that kind of tells me how to live my life. I'm going to decide for myself. And I mean, we live in this day and this age where that is the mantra by far that is talked about all the time is, I'm going to pick and choose my own beliefs. I'll pick a little of this. I'll pick a little of that. I mean, I want some... Maybe some of the stuff that Jesus said and some of the Christianity, but I don't want all of it, and I'll throw in a little Eastern you know, mysticism or some meditation or something else and kind of figure out my way of how to be a spiritual and a quote-unquote good person going forward. But it's my way. It's my truth. And it's really just about me and myself. And if I want to go that route, then this doesn't make any sense at all. To say that there's going to be a time and a place as followers of Jesus where we are going to be responsible to each other in such a way that we need to expect this kind of action or reaction. And so we've got to understand this, that when Jesus talks about his church, he's talking about creating a community that is built off of truth and grace. And truth is the idea that that truth isn't my truth, that it's Jesus' truth. In fact, that Jesus himself is the truth. And that it's based on the reality, the objective reality, that he is God who has come to earth to relate this truth to us, which is the good news is it means this. When you believe in it and you trust in it and you follow it, you are standing on something much bigger and greater than yourself. You're standing on a bedrock that is bigger and greater than yourself. And to have that kind of truth in your life means you're not the one creating it, you're not the one defining it, because you know what happens when you create and define all your own truth? The weight of your universe weighs entirely upon you and what you believe and what you're going to do, and you don't have anybody else to help you that you already know isn't more than just a figment of your own belief and imagination today because tomorrow you might decide it's something else. And that is a lot of weight to carry. That's a lot of anxiety to carry. That's a lot of heaviness to carry around in this world when you have that kind of weight resting upon you and your beliefs that aren't based on anything other than you picking and choosing the ones that you want and that you feel like you like. And if you break that down too, if it's just your beliefs, you are a community of one. Nobody else has your beliefs. Nobody else is rallying around your beliefs. It's your own smorgasbord of beliefs that you have taken together. And that means there's nobody else that believes the same thing as you believe necessarily. And you don't necessarily want them to. But you are a community of one. And what do you call a community of one? Lonely. <laughs> United. Yes. There's truth to that too, right? Lonely and isolated in your unity. Absolutely. And, and think of that. I mean... This is the, all the talk of the town in terms of our culture and our community is like how there is a loneliness epidemic that is going on, right? Because you can now work from home. You can now order all your food to show up at your house, including your groceries. Like you don't have to go anywhere, talk to anyone. You don't have to keep up with friends other than if you want to on a virtual platform. And maybe there's a myriad of people who think you put out great stuff, but they aren't in your life. They're not speaking in your life. They're not encouraging your life. They don't even see the real you. It is an absolute recipe for loneliness and isolation. On the other hand, the church that Jesus is setting up is not just built on truth, but it's built on grace. A grace that says we all come into this truth the same way. We all walk through the door as sinful people. Bad people. Evil people. Wicked people. Okay, I'll stop. Um, we, <laughs> we all... Walk in here together. We're on this same page. We're all a mess. Jesus didn't come because we had it together. He came because we don't have it together, which means when we deal with each other's flaws or failings, we aren't standing in greatness. We're on the same level going like, okay, this may or may not be a problem I also struggle with, but I understand struggling with problems, right? I don't come in any kind of superiority. Jesus has his own stuff. He has to work with me in my life. And that is a big deal and a wonderful thing as we come as a community, to know that we come in God's truth and we come in his grace. So, okay, I clicked it. It's taking a minute. 
It really likes to doing that. All right, we're going with dramatic pauses today. That's our theme. Uh, this is Dr. Henry Cloud. I listened to a bunch of stuff from him a little while ago, and I was going back through my notes. I'm like, this is so practical. We're going to talk about some of what he says. But here's how he breaks down or defines confrontation. It is an important part of problem solving. It can help foster better communication and understanding between parties, leading to more productive and positive relationships. So don't think confrontation means someone's doing something wrong, and I'm jumping in their face, and I'm telling them, you're doing something wrong! Because that doesn't generally do any of what he just described up here. Right? In fact, but notice this too. He says, it can help. This is not a promise. This is not saying that if you do this one time, it's a guarantee. Because as you know, if you've worked with people at all or been around people at all, people have their own minds. And they make decisions that they want to make. This is how do we get the best result possible. It is not a guarantee. Which is why Jesus has three or four different layers of saying, if this happens, if this happens, if this happens, if this happens. Because you can't guarantee reconciliation. But he says, but you need to go towards it every time. It matters this much that we need to go towards it every time. And so here's just some practical steps towards reconciliation. Maybe. Start with, he, he, this is a great quote from him. He says, you want to talk to the best brain possible. So if you're going to confront someone, you want their brain to be the best version of their brain, which means how you start the conversation is going to matter dramatically. And I love that picture of the best brain possible. Because, right, if you just start yelling at somebody, you did this and that, I mean, one, if you're right and you saw the situation right and they feel really guilty about it, then just yelling at them might work some of the time. Because, right, if they have a guilty conscience, they're like, oh, my gosh, I know, you saw that, oh, I feel so bad. I mean, that, that's a thing. That will work sometimes. But let's face it, most of the time when we make bad decisions, we make sure we're making decisions with other people so we can spread the guilt and the blame out. Right, because then I'm only 30% responsible. And if you come yelling at me, I'm like, well, hey, they did it too. Hey, everybody's got a piece of this thing, right? Now, it's not just me. I only did it because they acted this way first. And then if you're just yelling at me, guess what? I don't mind spreading around the justification. Like, you don't have to talk to me like that. I'm not the problem, right? I can easily dismiss that. And that's, again, us in human nature. We love to do that kind of stuff. And so starting with this idea of like, how do we have this conversation matters tremendously. And so the, the first thing he says to do to get that best brain possible is to begin with affirming someone, which is a way of saying encouraging them or finding something positive about them that you can address. And you know what's crazy? It doesn't matter who you're dealing with. If you're willing to really look at them as a person who is worth loving and who is worth caring about, you can always find something to affirm. I was listening to a guy who was a missionary, and he was working with a variety of kind of interesting characters who were like anarchists and violent anarchists. Uh, and uh, he was sitting down with this guy who he's like, how am I going to relate to this dude who believes in all kinds of stuff that I don't believe in doing? But he came down to this. He said to this guy, he says, one thing that I just admire about you is how passionate you are about your beliefs. That you're willing to go to such, in my mind, extremes. How far you're willing to go because of how much you believe what you believe in. is, And that reminds me a lot of, of Jesus who was a man of incredible conviction and incredible passion and went incredible long distances for what he believed as well. And he used it as his affirmation to start the conversation. And this is something you can do too. When you have someone that you need to approach and talk to, you just have to find what is honestly something that I can say I admire about them. Maybe they just have a great work ethic. I mean, they may be a total liar and a total cheat, but they work really hard at it. And you're like, I admire how hard you work. That's a great place to start. Right, you just have to find and, and be honest. Like, man, those are that's positive. That's a, that's a good quality. It's just misdirected, right? But you got to start with those things. How can you affirm? And then you have to be able to express. Look, I want to talk to you about this, but but here's here's my goal. And I have to understand this is the goal of reconciliation: is closeness, relationship, and relational closeness. Now, you can't say it like that, probably, especially not if you're a guy talking to another man and you're at work. You can't be like, I'd like our relationship to be closer. Like that's not going to go well. Um, if you're a woman, you probably can. I don't know that for sure. But I get the vibe. The ladies are kind of like, we can totally talk about this and our feelings, and it's like no harm, no foul. If you're a guy, you got to put this in your own words. you got to be like, you know, something's gone wrong in this relationship. I want to murder you, and I'd like to be friends again, um, right? You know, there's some, some, some negativity here in this relationship. I'd like this to be a better... Figure out how you can say what makes sense in your own genre of who you're talking to. 
but you've got to be able to express, like, hey, here's the, here's the problem. Something has happened, and it's disrupting how, how we're going to be working together, how we're going to be together, how we're going to be acting together. But you also have to have this in your head, and this is like one of the big things I think is really huge for a lot of us, is you have to understand whatever the conclusion is, however you're going to re- reconcile this relationship, it has to be an answer that isn't going to be hurting you. Because a lot of times we can be, a lot of us are pleaser type people. And if we ever take a step down this path, we're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to do confrontation, so I'm just going to go with the easiest possible answer. And if this person is like, well, you just got to suck it up, you're like, okay, fine, I'll suck it up. And that's not what this is. This is saying I've got to come to a conclusion and I've got to hold, stick to my guns and say, no, no, this isn't going to be something I'm going to be paying for alone. Like for this to be reconciled, there's going to have to be give and take. Let me give you an example. I heard a story of a woman who was trying to build a relationship with her father. And she was in her 40s. Her father was in his late 70s, I think. And, uh, and they had an estranged relationship for years and years. And her, her dad had been just a jerk his whole life uh, and just was mean. I mean, he just couldn't say nice things about anybody if you started talking with him. He was that guy that always was like, you're never going to amount to anything, and of course you're a failure. I mean, just saw the negative and just spoke it at everybody. And so uh, she would try to talk to him and get him on the phone, and it just always turned negative. And she was talking to a, a friend, uh, a pastor, and he was say, telling her, like, look, you just have to set boundaries up with your dad. And just tell him, look, Dad, I am a human being, and I've got the dignity of a human being. I'm made in God's image like everybody else. And if you can't treat me that way, then I'm just going to hang up the phone. But because I love you, I'll call you back next week. But I'm not going to argue with you, and I'm not going to defend myself. I'm just going to hang up. And then do it. And so she called her dad, and she had started the conversation with that. And he immediately launched off on this tirade, and she hung up on him. And she didn't call him back until the next week, and she got back on the phone and said, hey, Dad, I just want you to know, and repeated again what she said she was going to do. And he hung on for a solid minute before he got negative, and she hung up on him again. And this went on for weeks and weeks and weeks, and each week he got a tad bit better. Like by the fifth week, they could actually talk for five minutes before it just spilled over. But she kept sticking her guns and hanging up on him. And month after month, it got to the point where finally they could have a conversation where he did not go down that path because like, he had to learn for the first time in his life that if he wanted to have this relationship, and he did want to, he wanted to have the relationship with his daughter, that he wasn't going to be able to treat her the way he'd been treating people his whole life. And that's what we're talking about, is how do you begin to have these kind of boundaries that are up and this wisdom that is up for going to reconcile situations. They don't get fixed the first time. And so there's a wisdom in going about that. Here's, a, I think, a good biblical picture of Jesus doing this. <laughs> All right. John 2, 23. Because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust in him. But Jesus didn't trust them. How interesting is that? That's pretty interesting. Because he knew all about people. No one needed to tell him about human nature. For he knew what was in each person's heart. Isn't that kind of wild? So here's Jesus, this incredibly loving, incredibly compassionate individual. And yet it says that he knows what's going on with people, so he doesn't trust them. He works with them. He gives himself. He he helps them. He's healing people. He's speaking to them, teaching with them. But he isn't trusting them. This is a bit of the picture of where healthy boundaries start to come from. Because there's going to be people in your life that you're going to be able to trust at different levels of trust. And Jesus does the same thing, right? He's got his closest friends, his closest guys, his 12 disciples. And together, like when they get get done with the crowds and these big days where there's thousands of people, they either hike away in the middle of the night to get away from the crowds or hop in a boat and sail across a lake to get away from them. And his 12 are his guys. He's always around in his go-to guys. And they're his close friends, and he trusts them. On the other hand, there's three guys in that group of 12 that he seems to trust even more. Peter, James, and John, he takes to the top of the mountain where he's transfigured, and he tells them, don't tell anybody about what you just saw. He takes those three guys into a room when he raises Jairus' daughter, and he tells them all, don't tell anybody what you just saw. Like, there's different layers of which he's trusting and revealing himself to people, and this is where we have to learn that same thing. To what degree should we trust the people that are in our lives? How far do we go? How far is this trust worth with these individuals? And this is just one of those important lessons because Jesus is always compassionate, 
no matter whether he trusts them or not. Like Matthew 9 says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And some of us have a lot of people in our lives that maybe that's a good qualifier for them. They don't quite know how to do life. They don't know how to do relationships. They don't know how to follow Jesus. And it means we have to have compassion on them, go after them, love on them, but at the same time, it doesn't mean we can totally trust them. And I love that Jesus says that this is how he, how he, wrote, he is motivated. He isn't motivated by trust. He is motivated by compassion. And when we are working on reconciliation, it's the same thing. We'd like to get back to a place of trust, but trust is the hardest thing to rebuild. And it's going to start with us saying, man, it's my heart breaks for who they are or what they're doing or what is happening in their life. And I want to see God's grace. I want to see his mercy. I want to see restoration. I want to see health. I want to see whatever it might need to be for them. And that's the motivation behind it. We just can't confuse that kind of tough love with saying that I can totally trust them all the time. <laughs> all right, so the next practical step is this. Get their perspective on the problem. You come to somebody, you're like, man, there's something going on. I really appreciate this stuff about you. Here's kind of my goal. Here's where you begin. You ask them, I, you say, I saw this, or you've been doing this, or I've noticed this. What do you think about this? Here's what I'm feeling. Here's what I'm thinking. What's your perspective on it? How is this impacting you? What do they have to say about the issue, the situation, the circumstance? And find out what they, what they think. And I love this. He said, when they feel understood, their brain grows as they begin to consider how to change. When you begin to ask somebody, what do they think about something, as they begin to understand how you are seeing it, and they have to put into words what they're doing, he, literally, science is telling us your brain begins to change. Not their mind begins to change. Literally, their brain begins to change. Like, you know, your, your brain and our thinking is a lot like these well-worn paths. If you ever go like walking through a pasture or a countryside, right, and you've got grass everywhere, but you can see where all the animals or all the people are walking all the time. Like you have certain thoughts that, you, that just happen all the time. When you hear news or you get information or you have certain relationships or certain conversations, these are well-worn paths of your brain, your thought, and your mind naturally and natively and instinctively follows down the most worn paths in your, in your life, which is why habits, starting new ones is hard and ending old ones is hard. Because they're all well-worn paths in your brain of your thinking, like your go-tos. When I get stressed out, I do this. Changing one of those is one of those hard things. But it's where your brain literally begins to grow. You just begin to form new paths and close off old paths. So when you have a conversation based on asking someone questions and then processing it, you're beginning to help their brain change. I just think that's cool that we can even know that kind of stuff. Um, it's brain work. Mirroring back to them what they're saying. Ask them what they think about the issue, what they think about the problem, and then repeat back. So you're saying this. You know who's really, really good at this? My mother-in-law. And she's right here in the middle today. Yep, Carolyn, just wave at him. You're not waving. There she is. Thank Carolyn. Thank you. If you really want to practice this after the service, she is totally good for that. Like, she's a people person. She'll love it. She'll even give you, like, constructive tips. I'm not kidding. I learned a lot of this in practicality from both. Carolyn and Paul, in reality, Christian and I did. And back in the day when we were first married, this saved us from a lot of stuff. Um, so this is legitimately awesome, is when you can begin to, to repeat back, because then you're stepping into their story, their dialogue. It gives you a chance to empathize, which means I'm understanding you. And when people start talking out loud why they did something that might have been sketchy or questionable, as opposed to just justifying it, and you repeat it back, and they hear you repeat it back, it does begin to change things. So if somebody is like absolutely convinced that their alcohol isn't a problem and they start repeating it back and you're like, so coming home intoxicated, you know, crashing out on the front lawn in front of all the neighbors, not a problem for you or your family, like nobody's bothered by that, the medical reports, how your liver's doing, none of that bothers you, it's totally cool, it's healthy, you're saying that's healthy. And you start having those conversations, people start going like, well, I didn't say healthy. Well, I'm not saying that's good. I mean, all of a sudden, it's, their brain has to grow to like, I have pat answers because I'm picking on alcohol right now, but every one of us has weird habits and does dumb stuff and wrong things because we can justify it. Because the pathways in our brains have been justifying it forever. 
And it's easy for us. And it's not until we really think hard in a different way with a new opportunity that it really begins to change. So it's an incredibly significant thing just to be able to do this, to have this mirroring conversation. And you don't even have to set up a whole reconciliation. You can do this to people unaware over lunch at times. Just be like, that's an interesting choice. Tell me why. Did so that worked out well. Just see what happens. It's fun. This is, I love this, this is another Henry Cloud quote. He says, the goal isn't for you to understand them, but for them to understand that you understand. So this is money. We're, we'll just let this soak in for a second. When we often get up the courage enough to go confront someone, it's usually because we're fed up, right? And we're angry about it. And we're like, Ur, and we want them to know. And really, we're more concerned that they understand us. I want them to understand me, my pain, why I'm fed up, my anger. I'm the one that's offended. This is radically different. This is getting to that best brain scenario that says, okay, I'm going to understand them first. And if they understand that I understand, if they feel like they are really understood, you know how much we all need innately as human beings to feel understood? Like being understood is the difference between being in a large room and with a crowd of people and going, these are my people. They understand me. If I don't feel like I'm understood in a crowd, I'm, like, I'm just a face in a crowd. But these aren't my people. I'm, I'm as good as a stranger in this crowd if they don't understand me, if I don't know and believe that they understand me. This is how community is formed. This is how relationship, friendship is formed. Is There's a sense they understand who I am. And this is where it where gets this, in a sense, power or strength in terms of why it's so significant as we move forward into a relationship or into reconciliation, it's because, wow, it's actually quite rare to feel like there is someone who understands me. And this is the process in which we get to convey that. But it is a life-changing, conversation-changing moment when, man, you can get them to understand that you actually do understand them. In fact, I heard a guy who was an FBI negotiator say this is the key to negotiating with terrorists and kidnappers. Not, not kidding. It's really a fascinating article. I don't have time to go into it. I'm rabbit trailing. I wasn't even thinking about it until right now. Um, but it was wild to hear him tell stories. Go like, really? Like that? Anyway, they just want to be understood. <laughs> but we all do. Um, so, practical. So state your facts, not your judgments. Right? When you get into that place where you understand them, then state the facts. Here's what happened. Here's what I'm seeing. Here's what was done. Here's what was said. But don't stumble into judgments and focus on behavioral facts and events as opposed to just emotional ones, which is where we say things like, you lied and you always lie. Because you're a liar. <laughs> now, when I lie, I just lied because it was, you know, it was a one-off kind of moment. But I mean, when you lie, because you're a liar all the time. And that's when our emotions get the best of the conversation and we're not understanding a person because always and never are never accurate. Oh, can't get away from that. I know. Okay, occasionally they might be, um, but probably not if you're talking to a human being. We're not even consistently bad, right? We do good all the time too. So it is just important when we catch ourselves to focus on what are the facts, what are the behaviors, what are the concrete things, not just the feelings or the, or the attitude that I think you had or the emotion I think you felt. Here's what happened. Here's what was done. Here's what was said. And ask for specific and actionable results, right? When you get to this conclusion of like, so what is, here's what needs to happen. Here's what I want to see. Here's how we repair this relationship. Here's how we fix what was broken. And I love that last point, which is know what you want before you start. Now, most of these conversations, if we're honest, are going to be happening with people who are our friends or they are our family members or they are a coworker we work with a lot. This isn't like some random stranger that you're seeing, right? I mean, these are relationships that we have. This is significant to say, if I really want this to succeed, is to know before I go into it, what is it that I'm really asking? And it's got to be stuff that is practical. It's got to be stuff that's doable. Right? If what I want from them isn't even doable, if it's not actually practical, then I need to evaluate my own heart and go, like, what am I looking for in this person that maybe only Jesus can do? Like, this has to be something that a human being is, is, is capable of pulling off. But those are incredibly great ways to be prepared as you go in to those kind of conversations. And when you lay it out, ask again their perspective. Mirror it back to them one more time. Continue to, to launch into that being understood and understanding them component. 
And throughout all of this, the great motivation of compassion or to be reminded, as Romans 2, 4 puts, that it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. And repentance is a way of saying how we get to reconciliation. At some point, we have to say something was wrong. I did something wrong. I'm going to change something. That's all repentance really means. I'm going to change something. I'm going to turn from what I was doing to something else. I'm going to, I'm going to make a switch. But we often think it's judgment that's going to make us change. We often think it's guilt that's going to make us change. We often think it's going to be shame that's going to make us change or them change. And again and again and again, we see that it's God's grace, it's God's kindness, it's God's love that is actually what gives us hope that change is possible. It gives us hope that we can be changed in steps and in sequence because we can't be changed and be perfect tomorrow. That there is a, a way in which we can become the very people that God made and wants us to be. And I, I, I'm going to read a quote here that I, I think is, helps me when I ask this question of, if we're going to do this, maybe why still, how is a bit of it, but why this is really such a big deal. Why would Jesus start this conversation on something as maybe lightweight as the disciples argue about who's the best? I mean, if you've ever hung out with people, especially if you've ever hung out with a bunch of guys, this is a conversation that's like every day. Who's better at what? It's a constant challenge in comparison, right? And we live this. And I love that Lewis is talking about how we are setting ourselves in a direction by how we handle even these kind of little things in our lives. So here's what he says. He says, the worldly man treats certain people kindly because he likes them. The Christian, trying to treat everyone kindly, finds himself liking more and more people as he goes on, including people he could not even have imagined himself liking at the beginning. Now, I just say, that is something I have found to be so true. When you embrace that God says, like, love your neighbor as yourself, even love your enemies, and you're like, how do I demonstrate that with kindness? It begins to change just who you actually decide you like and how, who God helps you like. Then he says, the same spiritual law works terribly in the opposite direction. The Germans, perhaps, first ill-treated the Jews because they hated them. Afterwards, they hated them much more because they had ill-treated them. The more cruel you are, the more you will hate. And the more you hate, the more cruel you will become. And so on in a vicious circle forever. Like that's a pretty frightening, but also very rational understanding of our behavior though, isn't it? I mean, if you think about people that have made you mad or upset you or have hurt you and you don't reconcile with it, every time you see them, think about them or see something that they post, you re-experience those things. And then you have that feeling you're harboring, that bitterness, that grudge, that resentment. And one way or the other, generally speaking, that builds up until you take it out on somebody. And then there's all kinds of guilt. You just took that out on somebody who wasn't really the cause. And then the next time you see that person, you hate them even more because now they're causing you to act in resentment and, and hold out a grudge against somebody else that you actually love. He, he goes on to say this, the same, whoop, see if it'll catch up. Good and evil both increase at compound interest. That's a fascinating way to think about good and evil. That is why the little decisions you and I make every day are of such infinite importance. The smallest good act today is the capture of a strategic point from which a few months later you may be able to go on to victories you never dreamed of. An apparently trivial indulgence in lust or anger today is the loss of a ridge or a railway line or a bridgehead from which the enemy may launch an attack otherwise impossible. And pretty, pretty logical pretty rational understanding of what we're building and creating in terms of our own lives, our own hearts. What we're harboring, what we're storing, what we're letting really rule our lives. And if we're going to lean into this idea of reconciliation, the first thing that we have to kind of come to grips with is that if we're talking to people who are part of the church, if we're talking to people who are followers of Jesus, who are fellow followers of Jesus, then all of this idea isn't based on what we think how people should act or behave. It's all based on who Jesus is. It's based on what he's done for us himself. He sets this example in 2 Corinthians 5. Paul says it this way. He says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. So just think about that for a minute. He's saying, look, when you come to follow after Jesus, there is something inside of you that has to die. There's an old person that has to die so that you can become a new person. This new life is going to be given to you. 
And if you think about the person in you that is angry, that is easily offended, that holds all these grudges, that has hatred, that won't forgive, that's got bitterness and resentment that's been building up inside and is determining your actions and your choices and how you live your life. He's saying these are all the things in us that end up working out more cruelty into this world, more indifference into this world. And this is the part of us that Jesus has come to say that part needs to die. The part of Corey that lives that way, thinks that way, feels that way, interacts that way, that part of Corey needs to die so that there can be a brand new version of Corey be born. And I love that he says that right there, that this old life is gone, a new life has begun, and all of this is a gift from God. This all begins, this new life begins as a gift. It's not earned, it's not religiously practiced to be found, It's a gift that comes to us because God gives it to us. It's the only way this new life, this new heart, this new person, this new creation can begin. All this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. This all begins not with just how do I get reconciled with other people, but it really comes down to how do I help people be reconciled to Jesus himself? How do they become reconciled to God, that there is a break between people and God? It's not friendship. It's not even tolerance. Paul describes it as we're enemies of God. Jesus steps into that state of a world that is at enmity with God, that is enemies with God, and he has done everything for us to give us this gift that says, Everything's been done for you to be reconciled with God. And once you're on that same page with God, then reconciliation with each other becomes a real possibility. There's agreement. There's unity that's found in one person, in Jesus himself. He says, For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Check that out, that yellow. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, bringing the world back into relationship, solving the problems that have created all this distance, all this mistrust, all these lies that we believe, all the things that we have set our firmness on, that we're going to govern our own lives, we're going to be in charge of ourselves, we're going to define truth for ourselves, we just want to be in charge of our own lives. And he's saying he has done all the work to reconcile that brokenness that that all leads to, that loneliness and isolation that leads to, that more compounding of hurt that that leads to, to bring us back into a relationship with God as our Father, into the family that God wants us to be. And he no longer counts our sin against us, not because of anything we've done, because of what Jesus has done. This is the grace that we step into. It's the grace that puts all of us on the same footing of being servants to one another, of not measuring out any kind of greatness spiritually or morally, but understanding that we've all come through the righteousness of Jesus himself. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. How awesome is that, that he's saying that this is what we do as followers of Jesus? When we pursue reconciliation, we've been given this as a command, as a challenge, as our mission, as our job to be a part of inviting people to come back into a relationship with God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. That's a verse worth memorizing, meditating on. That God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, for your sin, for my sin, so that we could be made right. We have all the rightness of God, of Jesus in God's eyes. He's made us totally right with himself. This is the one reconciliation that you're guaranteed, by the way, because it's not up to you. It's been done for you. It's being offered to you. You can't guarantee that you can reconcile with any other person because it takes two to fully reconcile. You can forgive a person and be free from the issue, the harboring and the pain and the hurt. 
But you may or may not be able to reconcile. But this is a promised and guaranteed one because everything that had to be done for it has been done except for one thing, which is simply accepting it, receiving it, wanting it, and understanding that to receive that I have to acknowledge that I need God's help. I need him. It's really just inviting God to come and be at home in my life, in my heart, in my body, to take up resonance here with me, to ask him to come and fill this void in my own life, fill these hurts, fill this pain, to realize I don't have the answer and the solutions for all of it. I need him to come and do it. And it's an incredible offer and promise that Jesus is giving us, that he has not only paid for it all, but he's paid for everything we've done. Think of every, every word of anger you have spoken or action you've taken against anyone. Any betrayal that you've experienced or that you've done or perpetrated. Jesus has come and he has paid for all these things. He himself, how many people were angry at him and cursing him when they were crucifying him? I mean, betrayal is how he got there. He's lived out these things as well as taken upon himself these things. And in a very real sense, it's our anger, it's our betrayals, it's our words that crucified him for us. But he didn't come here because you and I are pretty good people. He didn't die on a cross because you're pretty good, mostly good. You could almost get to heaven all by yourself. It's not why he came. He came because you are lost. And you don't even know the first step to get back to being in a relationship with God, that you could never pay this price for your own sin. He comes and does this because there's no other way possible for us to be set free. You can't pay for it. It's a gift. But Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That's what he came to do. And if we want to receive that, if we want to walk in that, if we're going to live in that, we have to understand that's true every day. We've always been those people who are going to receive God's grace from him, and it's always going to be grace. And when we look at our friends, we look at our family, we look at people around us, and we ask, Mike, how do we engage? How do we confront? How do we reconcile? We always come at it as people who remember we are incredibly forgiven people. We've been incredibly reconciled to God, and we can know that and experience that and be confident in that. And that's where the strength and the love comes from to be able to speak in other people's lives. And so as we close this morning, this moment, I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes, bow your heads. Let's just take a moment to pray. But I want to invite you that if you're here this morning and you've never begun with God to receive this gift that Jesus is talking about, that he came and brought through the cross, then to invite him into your life to come and be at home in you. To invite him to put to death the things in your life that frankly you want to get rid of and you just don't know how and they keep coming back. And invite him to come into your life and give you a new life. When you invite God to be at home in you and with you, you're going to find for the very first time that you feel like you've come home yourself. God is the home that you've been looking for. That Jesus is the home that you've been looking for. And that his fellow followers are the very family that you've been looking for. And I'm going to just pray a short prayer. And if you want a a prayer that you can pray to begin that conversation, then you can just pray this in your own head, in your own heart to God. But pray something like this. Father God, I believe that you sent your son pay this price for my sin and I'm recognizing right now that I need that I can't save myself I can't fix these problems myself I can't heal these relationships myself and I'm asking you to come and live in me to heal my heart to heal my mind, to heal my life pour your love into me and I pray these things in the name of Son Jesus.